When it comes to the graveyard shift, almost every employee tries to avoid it. But on the other hand, the night shift pays more than the day shift. When I joined the local coffee shop as a barista, I expected a lot of creepy strangers my way, drunk dudes who try to hit on you, and crazy old ladies that scream at you for no reason soon became a daily dose of my entertainment. The coffee shop is generally operated by a drive through during the day. Apart from me, there worked another girl named Susie. Susie and I became good friends in very little time. She was always jolly and went the extra mile to serve the customers. I admired her level of patience in handling rude and creepy customers. But this one night, when Susie was stuck at home with the fever, I was assigned to pull the all-nighter. The owner offered me double pay, hence I couldn't resist. After quite a rush until midnight, the arrival of customers started to loosen up, having a little break. I went to the back of the shop to smoke in peace. When I returned, I saw this car waiting near the drive through window. A tall man was lunging from the passenger seat window and peeking inside the drive through I quickly got in, apologizing in a polite tone. Um, welcome to Super Coffee, sir. Sorry to keep you waiting. Once he saw me, he went back to his seat. I stood near the window and asked, What would you like to order, sir? Where were you? Um, I went to take the trash out. Huh. Suddenly, he came real close to my face and started smelling in a very creepy way. He sniffed me like a dog and then let out a huge grin. Why do you smell like cigarettes then? By this point, I was going through so many emotions. His face was probably inches away from mine. I'm... I'm sorry, sir. I just went to take a break. That he could report me for smoking on duty and keeping him waiting seemed more important than his cringy behavior. I just stood silently with a sad face. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't report you. He slowly went back into his car and gave his order. I smiled awkwardly but felt a little relieved that he at least understood my situation. While the coffee was getting done, the man continued chatting with me. And this is where things started to take a dark turn. He took out a small fishing hook from his pocket and began peeking his teeth with it. As disgusting as the sight was, I tried to look away. So what time do you get off, Angela? He read my name tag tucked in my uniform with too much attention. Late in the morning, sir. <sighs> Stop calling me sir. Do I look that old? Honestly, he did. But I continued his rant to be safe and not push him to report me. I didn't mean that, sir. So what do you do after you go home? Do you shower? Excuse me, what? <laughs> Come on, no need to be mad. It's just a basic question. I don't think I need to answer that. I poured his coffee and placed it right in the window. Here's your coffee. That'll be $2.70. Don't you think you should hand me that coffee yourself? There, his voice changed. I got goosebumps. With shaking hands, I grabbed the cup and raised it toward him. He suddenly grabbed my hand and smashed the coffee cup. Hot boiling coffee splashed on my skin, and his too. Ah! What are you doing? Our hands were burning, but surprisingly, there weren't any signs of pain in his face. He stared through his cold, dead eyes and let the coffee burn our skin. Leave me, you freak! Let me go! He pulled me closer to him and said in a low but scary voice, I don't like girls who think they're better than me. That was the end of my tolerance level. I slapped him and kept punching him to let go of me. But slowly, he pulled me into his car right from the drive through window. I heard a car horn when my body was halfway out the window and the man immediately left my hand. Without waiting for a second more, the man started the car engine and fled the scene. I broke down crying, holding my burnt hand. The next day, I returned to the drive through and reported it to the owner. I asked him to see the security footage when he said the CCTV camera needed fixing. So that means there's no evidence of what he did to me? I was mad and hurt, but the owner, instead of helping me, blamed me for leaving the shop to go for a smoke. He didn't care about the safety of his employee, 
I was so furious that I quit the job right away. Susie was standing there when I was leaving. She consoled me for what happened and told me to take care. I hugged her one last time and said to be careful while working the graveyard shift here. I kept in touch with her after that. She told me the owner had fixed the security camera two days after I left. I warned Susie about this man but never thought he would have the guts to return. One week after this incident, I got a call from Susie's boyfriend. He said Susie hadn't come home since last night. She was doing her night shift at the coffee shop and was supposed to return home after work, but never showed up. That's when an awful feeling hit me. Did something happen to her? Then one day, I saw it on the news. Susie's dead body had been found, and her killer was none other than the same man from that night. He kidnapped her and killed her in the garage of his home. The most horrifying thing was the ransom picture he sent to Susie's parents. He staged her body like a living person. What kind of sick psycho does that? The story you just saw is loosely based on the bone-chilling murder story of 18-year-old Samantha Koenig. She was working her night shift at the Common Grounds coffee stand in downtown Anchorage. As she was finishing her shift, the young barista was approached by a man later identified as a serial killer named Israel Keys. Keys hid his face under a ski mask. He threatened Samantha with a gun and took her to his property. He then tied her in a shed and used a radio to cover up her screams for help. Keys poured a glass of wine, drank it in front of Samantha, and then strangled her with the rope, leaving her body in the shed. Keys flew to New Orleans for a two-week vacation with his family. After returning from his vacation, Keys decided to take Samantha's ransom photo to get money from Samantha's parents. While she had already died by this time, Keys ensured to show her alive in the photo. He sewed her eyelids open with fishing line, braided her hair, and applied makeup to her face. Keys then propped the body against the wall and took the picture. He called the photo proof of life indicating that the victim wasn't harmed by him. Keyes was arrested in 2012 by the FBI. In his chilling interview, he explained how he chose his victims. I have worked as a maintenance staff all my life. I have stayed awake in graveyards, roamed dark halls of storage units, and spent nights in abandoned asylums. But still, that one night at that school made me crap my pants. One of my former bosses recommended me to this all-girls boarding school on the hillside. Surrounded by deep woods and tall hills, the building was a world in itself. I watched the place every night after the end of school hours. The teachers and the students stayed in the hostel behind the school building. I unlocked the school very early in the morning, even before sunrise, and ran a quick check before the commencements of the classes, then carried on with my cleaning work as the progressed. So it was a Monday after the weekends. The girls have just arrived at their classes. Once again, the place was under rules and regulations. I went to unlock the washroom on the third floor. That was the biggest one in the school. It had 12 stalls lined up on one side with tiles of mirrors on the other. I entered and opened the stalls one by one. By the fourth or fifth stall, a reeking smell hit my nose. It was like rotten meat, and that too in its worst form. One by one, I kept opening the stalls and pushed the door. By the tenth stall, I was sure something had died in this washroom. The reeking smell was getting difficult to stand now. I covered my face with my hand and opened and pushed the eleventh door. You say you locked the school and there was no one. Then how come Gretchen got locked up? I don't know. Don't you think she would say something hearing I was locking the door? Trust me, officer. She was not inside that stall when I locked it one month ago. All right. Well, let's see where this investigation takes us. Do not leave the premise till then. The cops left with Gretchen's body and I sat on a bench in the ground floor corridor. Gretchen was a student here in Ninth Standard. 
I remember her because she came into the middle of the term. But who knew she would be found dead in the school bathroom right after summer vacation? The cops came for a week straight, but they couldn't solve the case of Gretchen's mysterious death. Since that day, weird things started happening in the school. One day on a rainy afternoon, I have just started checking the classes to lock up the property. Students have already left for their hostels. I walked up to the third floor and suddenly felt a rush of cold wind at the back of my neck. It was as if the temperature of that floor had just dropped to minus. My eyes went to the big wooden door at the end of the hallway. I felt goosebumps for the first time, realizing I was alone in this vast building. I took slow footsteps to the washroom and pushed the main door. After Gretchen's death, students stopped using this washroom. I even heard some of them feeling weird in here. I got in and started locking the doors. I opened each stall, checking if they were empty and closed it. By the time I was on the 11th, my heartbeat was racing. I raised my hand, but it remained in the air, shaking. I couldn't reach for the doorknob because an unknown fear had wrapped inside my mind. I don't know why I kept thinking that if I opened the door, I would see dead Gretchen sitting on the toilet seat, smiling at me. To hell with it. I turned around without locking it. I was heading for the exit door when I heard loud knocks behind me. I stopped. I slowly turned my head. It was pin drop silence. Uh, hello? No one answered. It stayed quiet for a few seconds, and then again. Knock, knock, knock. I froze. This is all not true. My crazy mind is playing tricks on me. I wasn't ready for this. Someone was crying inside the washroom. There was a pain in her voice. Maybe it was really another student. Gathering the leftover courage I had, I asked, Do so you need help? I, I can call the teachers if you want. But she kept on crying. I started walking now. The more I walked closer, the sobbing grew louder. Once I stopped outside the 11th door, the crying stopped. I knocked on the door. Hey, is everything all right? Please come out. I twisted the doorknob, holding my breath, but... But the stall was completely empty. The entire washroom started echoing with laughter. Whoever was laughing didn't feel like a human being. I saw the main door slowly closing in the wind and started running. The laughter was getting louder. I covered my ears with my hands and ran for my life. As I exited the washroom, its door slammed loudly behind me. It was like an invisible force shut the door in my face. Whoever has inside left me with a warning to never step foot in there again. When I reached the stairs, I looked again at the hall, and I saw something that will forever be imprinted in my memory. There was a face peeking at me from the half-open washroom door. The fading sunlight made it visible enough to chill my bones. The face looked like Gretchen, only it wasn't Gretchen at all. Its skin was rotten in places. The eyes were wide and never blinked. Her long hair dangled with the wind. She was staring at me from the end of the corridor. I am a 33-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life in the graveyard shift. The place I currently work is a corporate building. To get the layout, there are three office building floors with infinite cubicles and cabins on each floor. The building itself has three exits on the first floor. There are always some employees pulling overnighters on the third floor. My job was to keep an eye on the place till everyone left. This was midsummer, and while it's never boiling here, tonight was the exception. It was still hot after the sun had set. I came in to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off the keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I am the only security person here at night. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I swept all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was hushed, and it rolled around to 3 a.m. I had just sat down to eat my sandwich when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, Thanks for calling. This is Security Officer Peter. How can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavily. 
I glanced at the cameras and saw the shadow of a figure standing just out of reach from the door in camera view. I asked again, Hello? Can I help you? The man started to breathe heavier and then laugh. (laughs) It was one of those laughs you hear in a movie when the lunatic is about to do something terrible. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office and to the door he was at when it rang again. I quickly looked at the camera and he had his back to the camera. Suddenly, he spoke. I'm coming for you and you're gonna die. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. Then the phone rang again. This time I picked up and before he could speak, I let him know the cops were on their way. You better leave. I can see you. Are you ready to die? The cops won't make it here in time. He then slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the parking area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police, but the location of this place would take them at least 15 minutes to get there. I returned to my desk and wrote what had happened in the incident log. About half an hour passed and I was about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time, it was from an unknown number. It should be an employee calling or something. I picked up and heard, Where are the cops? I don't see them, but I see you. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and did not see anything. I went to the front door to look out. There was nothing but darkness and a few front floodlights. I warned the employees working on the third floor and told them not to come down until I saw so. The next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows of the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this man. He looked about 40 with long, stringy hair, poking down, and these wild eyes. He looked at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told the cops were coming and to get the f*** out of there. That's when he pulled the giant damn butcher knife I've ever seen and made a slicing motion like he was using it to cut my throat. This guy was crazy and probably on drugs. He continued slamming his body against the glass trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window but managed to bust his head open, so the window now had blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for the cops as this guy was out of control. I watched the camera and noticed, to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now, it was common for people to go out to their cars and unlock the door themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores. But this is the last thing I need with this nut job running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw the crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid the door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass. <laughs> he started to laugh and howl and then held that knife up again. He was bald with wild, long, stringy, crazy hair on the sides of his head, and his eyes were huge. I will never forget that grin as he mouthed, You're gonna die! Die! <laughs> while making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood ran across his face from slamming into the glass, and then he ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looked like, and I told him I had camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me that he couldn't find anyone, and had driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cops never found the guy or who he was, but after that night, I never worked the graveyard shift again. 